Welcome to MSL Presents A Question of Law. Thank you for joining us. This program is brought to you by the Massachusetts School of Law, the leader in reforming legal education, and is now seen on over 360 stations in the Northeast. The topic for today's show, Rape Shield Laws. After all the jokes about women's underwear and Ma Albert have subsided, what still remains is a serious issue, the use and the abuse of rape shield laws. Rape shield laws prevent the accused from exploiting the victim's past sexual history. Rape shield laws were enacted to protect victims of sex crimes from once again becoming a victim in court, a seemingly noble goal. However, the practical result is a defendant who sits in the courtroom accused of a very serious crime has his constitutional rights diminished. After reviewing decisions on the admissibility of evidence of the victim's sexual past, I worry that judges appear to favor the victim's rights over those of the accused, too often in an arbitrary fashion. However, there are some who would say, well, hooray for that. Joining me today, Essex County District Attorney Kevin Burke, one of the most active and progressive district attorneys in the state of Massachusetts. District Attorney Burke has led the initiative to mandate victim rights and services within the court system. He has been recognized by the U.S. Department of Justice for his outstanding efforts. Additionally, District Attorney Burke has been a leader in confronting domestic violence and teen violence, and he has established special units to prosecute rape, arson, white-collar crime, political corruption, and drug trafficking. Welcome, Kevin. Thank you. Attorney Constance Rudnick is a professor at the Massachusetts School of Law. She teaches constitutional law and is also a partner at the Boston law firm of Cargiulo, Rudnick and Cargiulo where for many years her practice included the trial and the appeal of criminal cases. Thank you for joining us, Connie. And I'm Diane Sullivan, a professor at MSL. Kevin, at common law, evidence of a victim's past sexual history was both deemed to be relevant and admissible in court. Why was that so? Well, I think that uh, in certain cases, uh, it, it, in common law, it ended up being usually a one-on-one -on -one, uh, type of uh, court or uh, judicial proceeding. What do you mean by one-on-one? -on -one? Well, uh, what I mean by that is that the, uh, the criminal defendant's story uh, was told versus the uh, victim's story, whether the person was a victim of a larceny, you know, if we want to go way back in mm -hmm. common law, the stolen pig, mm -hmm. or uh, whether the, ver the victim was uh, the victim of some kind of sexual assault. Uh, so the whole question of bias and motive uh, was uh, early on fair game and still remains fair game in uh, the criminal courts. Let me ask you a question. Is it accurate to say then at common law that a woman's sexual history, if she was in fact sexually active, it, it was thought to be the equivalent of dishonesty? Well, I mean, absolutely a uh, topic in uh, common law in any kind of sexual assault cases, and there were few, mm -hmm. uh, was uh, the uh, reputation of the victim. And uh, because the reputation of the victim was the topic of discussion, uh, given all of the other cultural biases that existed uh, uh, not so long ago, uh, women were very reluctant to come forward in the sexual assault cases. How has this changed, if at all? Well, I think it's changed dramatically. First of all, it was a huge cultural change, uh, uh, that uh, a sense in society, if you will, that uh, women shouldn't be twice victimized, that their reputation uh, for sexual conduct uh, shouldn't be considered as related to a, a particular accusation of rape, mm -hmm. uh, for example. And as a result, uh, starting about a quarter century ago, uh, statutes were passed, so-called rape shield statutes, which prohibited really the non-relevant uh, information regarding someone's reputation of victims, a woman's reputation from coming into uh, uh, evidence uh, during a trial. Uh, of course, we have one here in Massachusetts, uh, and I think it's really worked quite well with some uh, adjustment, uh, if you will, as, time's go as time has gone on. Thank you, Kevin. Connie, as I understand it, the first rape shield laws were enacted in 1974 or so in the state of, of Michigan. Let me ask you, how commonplace are they today? Uh, very commonplace. My understanding is virtually all jurisdictions, I think there may be two, uh, I can't name which one is off the top of my head, but uh, um, virtually all state jurisdictions and the Federal Code of Evidence uh, all have um, some kind of uh, rape shield, if you will, uh, statute governing the uh, admissibility of a victim's prior sexual history or activity. But there is jurisdictional differences in the way they apply the rape shield laws, is that correct? Yes, there are jurisdictional differences in the structure of the law and in what is, is admissible 
Um, uh, there are uh, about three or four different constructions. Um, the Michigan law, I think, is one um, it, which is very narrow. Uh, in other words, most everything is excluded. Uh, on the other hand, uh, is um, states like Arkansas, uh, which have very broad laws, mm -hmm. uh, those uh, I, I think require merely a balancing of the probative value, that is the relevance uh, against the prejudice. Uh, and then there are some that are in the middle, uh, which generally say it's not admissible except under certain um, circumstances, and that's the federal law and most of the state laws, and I would say Massachusetts falls into that middle category. And we'll come back and we'll talk about what, in your opinions, are, are the best statutes um, to, to balance the rights of the parties. Let me ask you this, from a criminal um, defense point of view, what do you see as the objective of rape shield laws? Uh, I think it, it depends on whether you mean what the intended objective is mm -hmm. or what the actual objective is. The, the intended objective is to, to um, uh, call out, as Kevin said, um, uh, evidence which one would con might consider irrelevant to the charge um, at hand. Uh, the, the, the saying is, you know, just because somebody is a prostitute doesn't mean that this time they d couldn't have been raped. Um, uh, and the, but the, sometimes it looks like the um, actual implementation of the laws uh, tends to keep um, what some might argue, certainly criminal defense lawyers might argue, is rel relevant and probative evidence from getting to the jury. Thank you, Connie. In your experience, Kevin, do rape shield laws really foster women coming forward? Because before we had rape shield laws, as I understand it, women were inclined to remain silent because they didn't want this type of intrusion into their personal life. Well, I think uh, the decision of a victim of rape to come forward uh, is as difficult today as it was uh, 25 years really? ago. But uh, in being able to speak to uh, investigators and to prosecutors and to rape counselors, uh, women are more easily convinced that there are some protections available to them. I mean, being a victim of rape is a horrible thing. Testifying to that rape, whether there's a rape shield statute or not, is a very difficult thing to do. Uh, so that uh, we have sent a message, I think, to women who are victims of sexual assault. We can handle you, that is the court system, the criminal justice system, with as much sensitivity as is possible, but it's never a very sensitive process in the end. So you think that women, if they hear from either your office or from some counselors along the way, that their sexual activity is not going to be an issue, it's not going to be relative, um, they will come forward much more easily than they would if we didn't have such protection? Uh, I believe so. I think women uh, look at it in a lot of different ways. Some women are angry. Uh, some women, uh, and I think this fits a majority of the cases, uh, are concerned about the, the potential for other victims if uh, this particular defendant uh, isn't brought to the bar of justice. And uh, they're convinced then that they have a role and they fulfill that role by coming forward in court. Thank you, Kevin. Connie, do you believe that rape shield laws protect a victim from harassment? Um. I hate to dodge the question, but I think it depends on what you mean by harassment. Um, I, I think that um, one thing that ought to be uh, raised is the, the fact that, that those uh, states in which there have been pre and post rape shield enactment studies mm -hmm. uh, have demonstrated that there is little change in the number of reported rapes um, as a result of uh, an active, uh, enactment of um, rape shield and other protective uh, legislation. So I, I don't know whether uh, the rape shield laws have had any appreciable effect um, on the um, psyche of, uh, of a potential victim uh, and the inclination to come forward or not to come forward. Um, certainly, it, we, we should have progressed beyond the point where sexual activity equals either dishonesty or propensity to lie or some kind of reputation evidence or character evidence merely by the fact that, that a woman is, is not a virgin at the time she takes the witness stand and testifies about um, uh, a rape case. Um, but um, I, I think sometimes we overplay the, um, the, 
differences or lack thereof between victims of rape and other victims. Certainly if uh, I, I was going to be cross-examining a victim uh, of a robbery um, and there was a question about that individual's ability to see, um, uh, observe, recount, relate, uh, uh, for any one of a variety of reasons, including mental problems, emotional problems, I'm going to try my hardest to discredit that witness. If you're, though, if you're representing a, a defendant that's been accused of rape, what type of evidence are you going to wish to bring in with respect to that victim? Well, I think it depends on what the defense is um, and what the circumstances are. If it's a question of um, identity mm -hmm. of, the, of the perpetrator, um, then you're going to want to obviously uh, bring in evidence that the person was not the individual who, who committed the rape. Um, that's very different from a consensual situation uh, where it, it, there's no doubt that there was, uh, your client was the individual who had intercourse and that uh, he, or in a very rare circumstance, she um, uh, was present and there was some kind of intercourse. The question is whether or not it was by force or violence or without consent. Um, so that's going to be that's going to be different. I think that the most important area where rape shield statutes potentially impinge upon a defendant's constitutional uh, right uh, would be either in prior fa false allegations um, and um, sort of the similar conduct um, uh, where uh, you've got motive uh, to, to fabricate or um, uh, modus operandi. In other words, an individual has engaged in this kind of, of uh, uh, accusation before. Um, now, some might say, well, it doesn't mean that this is necessarily the, um, uh, the situation in this particular case. But if I knew that a victim of a robbery mm -hmm. had accused five different people of robbing him or her, um, and the first four or five were not true or were dismissed or whatever, then uh, I think I have a right to put that before the jury, and I think under those circumstances, if the situations are close enough, I'd have a right to put it before the jury in, in a rape case as well. That's astounding to me. When I, when I read all the numerous uh, rape cases, and I saw that a, a victim could have made false allegations of rape in the past, and that's not admissible. Well, that's not true. I mean, it, there are situations where false allegations of rape are admissible. And in Massachusetts, for example, if you can document a false, a false allegation mm -hmm. and you can show it to be a pattern uh, of conduct on the part of the victim, then it, it is admissible. A false how, allegation how many, is admissible. Though? How many well, do you need to you have know, a pattern? Uh, a pattern uh, based on some case law can be one false allegation. Okay. However, usually it is more than one false, false allegation. Uh, and in Massachusetts, for example, uh, uh, the uh, fact that a, a victim has made claim against someone for rape uh, against whom a charge was brought and a trial occurred and there was a not guilty finding is not admissible. It is said, not. It, it is not admissible. Don't you think it should pattern. be, Kevin? Well, no, because again, it gets down to that materiality and relevancy. I mean, you just, uh, you, it's not such a leap to say that uh, it's possible that a woman could be uh, raped twice. Uh, could have been sexually assaulted twice, so unless one's clearly related to the other. And remember, especially in the case of a trial, uh, we have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the rape occurred. But uh, let the jury hear the evidence and let them decide. I mean, how likely is it that somebody is going to be raped twice and once make a false allegation? We want the jury to hear the evidence. We want the mm -hmm. jury to hear uh, the relevant, reasonable evidence in, in a situation uh, such as uh, prior uh, uh, complaint against rape or a prior trial where there was an, a finding of not guilty or a jury verdict of not guilty, uh, we don't think that's relevant to a second particular charge. Okay, I guess I'll just disagree with you respectfully on that one. Let's talk about the Mob Albert case for just a moment. Even if you agree with most or even many that a woman's uh, past sexual history should not be admissible, do you think that that was fair in the Mob Albert situation? That it wasn't admissible? Yeah, uh, and all the evidence about mob sexual practices came in. Well, I think that it, uh, again, uh, we're not trying the victim, we're trying Marv. Pattern of conduct evidence is admissible um, against criminal defendants and has been for some time. Uh, unless that uh, conduct, again, as we talk about false uh, allegation of rape, unless there was a, a particular pattern of conduct that uh, a victim evidenced it with Marv, uh, it wouldn't be relevant and material in order to be admiss uh, admissible. Um, the fact, and it is very common, uh, as we've talked about before, uh, a prostitute who obviously is engaging in sex on a regular basis can be raped. 
and the fact that uh, she has been engaging in sex with other people isn't relevant to that charge. Well, why not distinguish evidence, say that the victim uh, routinely solicits sex from third parties versus evidence that, say, the victim is a virgin? Can't we distinguish what is admissible and what isn't admissible? Wouldn't that make more sense? Well, again, I think you have to because it, it, it is so overwhelmingly biased. Again, you get into that cultural bias. You would take a whole class of people. Uh, that would be the people who are non-sexually act or who are sexually active and suggest that their sexual activity could be part of a trial. Now, if you can find a point where you can draw a line to say this level of sexual activity is relevant and this level is not relevant and therefore wouldn't unduly influence or improperly influence a jury, then you're smarter than I am. I think that the facts of a case have to stand on their own and the reputation, as statutes have said all over the country, of the individual victim should not be part of that case. Connie, your reaction? Yeah, my reaction is um, that there are going to be circumstances um, and they're well documented where women uh, claim to have been raped for a variety of reasons. Um, and they're not, they are not abating in their numbers uh, to any appreciable degree. I just read an article uh, the other day about um, uh, a situation, I think in Orange County, California, in which a woman had claimed uh, that she was raped in order to uh, hide a uh, extramarital affair from her husband. So um, I think that there is some realistic uh, fear um, that has to be addressed in terms of um, one's um, the, the protection of a defendant and his right to defend himself. Um, I'm also concerned because um, the the degree to which courts seem to be requiring proof of falsity in the prior false allegation is really almost an insurmountable task from a defendant's point of view. Uh, even a, a judgment of not guilty um, is uh, uh, insufficient. Um, uh, as uh, district attorney has indicated. So h how is anybody supposed to prove that something is false? Either the, the plaintiff has to, or the, the complaining witness has to retract or recant, um, or somebody else then has to come forward, confess, and be convicted of the crime. Uh, and that's almost impossible. Um, I, usually what happens is, um, in my experience, if somebody, if, if there isn't a not guilty um, or a dismissal, um, by a judge, then the, the district attorney's office will drop the charges if they really feel that the allegation does not merit um, going forward. And that would not be, is my, my understanding, sufficient evidence of a prior false allegation. Um, so I'm, I'm troubled because of the, um, ex the excess to which, or the standard to which um, some courts uh, place a defendant in improving what's prior and what's false. Um, and I also think that um, sometimes we tend to overlook the, the sort of pattern, or pattern uh, evidence um, that an alleged victim may uh, um, have in, in her past, uh, I suppose in his past, although it doesn't seem that, that um, female on male rapes is um, proceeding with any degree of uh, um, um, dominance. Um, and that is, if, if somebody comes in and testifies, I don't consent to that kind of sex, and you have 10 people, and that's the defense. That, that's, that's what I could not possibly have consented because I don't engage in that kind of Such sex. Such as the Marv Albert situation. Well, I don't want to be terribly specific on that, but as far as I understand, yes, there was some evidence that she in fact, had engaged in rough sex in the past. And biting was a part of her sexual activity. Yes, I, I, that's what I understand. Um, uh, and so if the, if the victim comes forward and says, well, I could not have possibly consented because I don't, I don't do that, and you have evidence that, yes, in fact, she does do that, um, I, I just don't see how keeping it out merely because it ha the do that happens to be sexual activity um, it's fair. It, 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 it's a, yeah, it's fair, and I don't think it's giving the jury a, a full picture of the uh, of the situation or the circumstances. But courts, isn't it accurate to say that courts have rejected arguments that rape shield statutes violate either due process or the right to a fair trial or unfairly discriminate against the sexes? Yeah, most courts. There are a few that have uh, under certain circumstances. Um, they rarely say uh, that, that the statutes discriminate all the time. What mm -hmm. they'll say is in this particular case, because of the facts, 
um, it discriminated against the uh, um, uh, or, or burdened or infringed, violated the defendant's constitutionally protected rights. Uh, usually the right of confrontation, um, sometimes the right to um, subpoena witnesses on your own behalf and present evidence on your own behalf. Those are the two uh, uh, most dominant constitutional challenges. Well, it should be clear about one thing, and I, I think it's important to make that point. A woman almost never, a victim almost never says, I don't engage in that kind of sex. First of all, the question would be improper as a, one of those questions excluded under the rape shield statute. Mm -hmm. If that question was asked by a prosecutor, then the door is open. But a prosecutor wouldn't ask exactly. that. Exactly. So, I mean, it, but it's not that kind of question that's asked. So but they have the right of to deny. They don't have the right of denial. Again, it comes down to that whole reputation issue. In, and I think you point, uh, pointed out appropriately, Diane. We're talking about a balancing act here. Right. Is there any protection? How valuable is the protection of a woman's uh, right uh, to come forward in a sexual assault case and not have her whole life exposed uh, versus uh, a defendant's right to raise what? And most people would uh, argue is clearly not a relevant issue. If we try to find that balance here, I wonder if you would agree that evidence, at least false accusations of rape, should be admissible. Would well, that be fair? Yeah, I think that there, again, I don't want to leave the impression, nobody should be leaving the impression that false allegations are not admissible. But you under said we need, you know, we, we need a regular patent of that. Under certain circumstances, they are admissible. Mm -hmm. And you start with the whole idea of documenting that false allegation, whether it's a medical record or a police report or something like that. Yeah. Uh, in fact, one of the areas that uh, people are losing sight of, uh, of, of in terms of the impact on uh, victims of sexual assault is that their entire psychiatric his, uh, history is uh, now subject to discovery, potentially, mm -hmm. by a criminal defendant in an attempt by uh, the appellate courts, I guess, to balance things. It doesn't automatically come in, but uh, psychiatric history wasn't coming into evidence at all 10 years ago. Uh, now the, it's, it's possible that that victim's entire psychiatric history comes in with, uh, into evidence if, in the court's eyes, the uh, uh, defendant, uh, after examining the various privileges, has made a reasonable uh, presentation as to the impact of the uh, uh, possible uh, exculpatory impact of the uh, psychiatric background. Uh, this is a frightening possibility to most women, and most victims of, se of sexual assault I have to be t told up front by the prosecutor, the police officer, or the victim advocate, you know it's possible a psychiatric history can come into evidence. And uh, do you think most women at that point will walk away? I think it's a ch it has a chilling effect. I know that it has a chilling effect on uh, some sexual assault cases. Mm -hmm. But in, in that, those situations, and I assume you're referring to the, in Massachusetts, the Bishop and Fuller line of mm -hmm. cases, um, there has to be some con that, a level which actually is rising um, I according to the uh, difference between the Fuller case and the Bishop case that the SJC, our Supreme Court in Massachusetts, has recently decided. And it's consistent, as I understand it, with um, many of the uh, other states' uh, laws um, uh, that do actually have some uh, probing into uh, psychiatric history. And then the court has to go through the information. Well, process, so it's yeah. So it's not it's not like a defendant says I think you're crazy and I want to see all your all your psychiatric history and all of a sudden it's sitting in the defendant's lap. Um, you do have a judge who's going to be um, uh, perusing it um, and scrutinizing it to make sure that the level of of proof um, uh, has been met and that somebody is not willy nilly going to be raked over the coals. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think anybody necessarily is advocating uh, that we make. Uh, a, a rape victim, um, a, a victim again I I in the trial. Um, but I don't, as I said that before, I don't see um, that there's that much of a difference between um, attacking the credibility, the bias, motive to fabricate uh, of somebody who, where the crime is a rape uh, than when the crime is an assault with a dangerous weapon or a robbery or um, uh, any other kind of crime that doesn't involve uh, uh, sexuality. That there's going to be an attack on the credibility of, of the victim. Um, and uh, it just depends on what that, uh, the nature of the, of the credibility uh, goes to. If it, go, if it happens to be a sex-based crime, it's going to go to the sexuality. If it's a 
ability to observe and recount crime. It's going to go to those two things, including perhaps the person's uh, emotional state and uh, um, drug dependency or a variety of very private issues. Let me ask you a question. Are either of you concerned that in some jurisdictions, whether this evidence comes in is really left to the discretion of the judge? Is that problematic to either of you? Well, it's not problematic to me. I mean, uh, if you ask me in a specific case, I might say <laughs> it was problematic, but. Uh, it's the nature of our judicial system of jurisprudence. We have to make uh, leave two judges a lot of very difficult, uh, sensitive decisions, and I accept that. Uh, I I think that um, um, I think I can live with with having a judge make a decision as long as the there are certain situations and there is an, enough of a. Uh, um, an opening for a judge to uh, decide that sometimes these, uh, this evidence is going to be relevant and ought to be admissible. I, I think that leaving it up to a judge, if you tie his or her hands and make it virtually impossible, um, is, is really um, uh, a pyrrhic victory, uh, if you will, for the defendant. Let me I, ask and you. I just want to make sure. one point just so that, we, that our, our viewers aren't too co uh, confused. You know, the whole issue of motive of bias isn't excluded in a rape trial. It's only excluded as it relates to sec prior sexual conduct, the reputation of an individual. So motive of bias apart from that uh, is something that uh, can come into evidence. But sometimes that, let me just, sometimes that motive or bias, Kevin, is going to be um, uh, related to the sexual history, just like the case in, in California where the woman um, was having an extramarital affair, whether she wanted to cover up uh, um, uh, pregnancy or sexual disease or whatever, um, um, or, or just not being around at a, at a given period of time. Um, uh, it was, it was an, it, that, that is motive to, to fabricate. Um, sometimes it's retaliation against the, uh, uh, the victim, I mean, sorry, against the, um, the defendant um, for personal reasons. So um, uh, I think that more often than not, motive and bias in a rape case is going to have some sexual overtones and is going to fall uh, into a potential rape shield problem. It's not going to be as a result of something unrelated to um, to one's sexual activity. But it is a limited area. Motive and bias can come into evidence. Uh, it can, you can present the evidence to show a reason other than sexual activity being the basis for the sexual complaint. And I, we can't lose sight, sight of the fact, I certainly can't lose sight of the fact as a prosecutor that we're left with the burden of proving a case beyond a reasonable doubt. And what does that mean in sexual assault cases? Since the vast majority of them are cases where the defense is consent. It is having some other piece of evidence uh, that shows that this isn't just a personal dispute between two people. Uh, and usually that kind of evidence is uh, fresh complaint evidence. Uh, that is shortly after the act has occurred in a reasonable period of time, although that's subject to some definition depending on the control of the defendant might have over the victim, uh, that there is a complaint made, either the right crisis uh, center or to a, a hospital, mm -hmm. uh, to a friend, to a family member, et cetera. That's a critical part of the evidence. We don't bring these cases on our own, and hundreds of cases um, are not brought on the basis that there is no additional evidence other than the revelation of the part of the victim. I got to cut you off, Kevin. I'm sorry, but we're out of time. I hope you'll both come back and we'll continue this conversation at a later date. Thank you both very much. And to our viewing audience, until next time, be well. Thanks. Thank you.